Good morning. It's Steve from Southern Illinois, and I want to start out with a sincere apology to my friends in Minnesota and Alaska for my uh, disparaging comments last week about uh, us having real snow down here. Um, yeah, this week you sent us down an arctic blast and only part of my garden has survived and so please take your snow and cold back. Um, we southerners, uh, we may pride ourselves in our ability to handle cold, but um, yeah, you can have it. Today is chilly uh, and drippy and so I cannot sit down because my wife would be very unhappy if I ruined this, the uh, varnish on the chair, the kitchen chair that I usually sit in. So you're going to have to take me standing up this week. I want to share a story that happened the first time that we went to visit our daughter in New Zealand. The kids decided that a bird watching trip would be enjoyable. They know that I love nature, they know I love birds, and see New Zealand is situated right on the edge of a undersea cliff which forces the currents up to the surface and um, there's a lot of fish living there and so seabirds gather there. So this was a seabird watching trip which meant we were going to get in a rather small boat and we were going to go out into this large bay and we were going to look for birds. Which sounded all fine until it got to the morning we were going and the fog was so thick that as we were driving to the harbor to get on the boat I could barely see in front of the car. And it was like, oh man, this is going to be exciting. Yeah, bird watching in thick fog. <laughs> but being um, crazy, um, and after the uh, tour guide reassured us that we would see birds, um, we decided to go. So we get in this boat, it was, it was basically like a little small fishing boat, and we set out onto the bay, and as we're going, I notice that in the, uh, the pilot's cabin, he has a depth finder, uh, basically a sonar that, that was looking downwards. Um, some fishermen use them to identify where fish are. He was using it to find the channel uh, because uh, he couldn't see any further than we had been able to see as we were driving uh, there. And he had lookouts posted on each side of the, of the ship, of the boat, and one in the front to look for obstacles. And he was carefully steering the boat uh, through the channel on the way out of the harbor. Well, we get out on the harbor, and the, the first 10-15 uh, minutes were absolutely miserable. You know, fog is basically clouds, and it's always chilly, and it's wet. And we were sitting there in this boat, going up and down and up and down and rocking side to side, and the fog and the cold and the chill. It was not very fun, and uh, some of us, I will not mention who, uh, started um, <clears throat> feeding the fish on a regular basis. Um, and then all of a sudden, out of the fog, appears this bird. And I'm not talking a sparrow. I'm not talking a robin. I'm not talking a seagull. This was an albatross with an 11-foot wingspan just gliding along effortlessly just above the waves. It was the most awesome experience I've ever had. I mean, bird watching. Yeah, this is bird watching. Okay, and that morning we saw albatrosses, we saw gannets, we saw boobies. They would appear just out of nowhere. How could they fly in that fog? 
but they would just be gliding along. Okay, now the tour guides knew that we were going to see fish because they had bought brought bait. They had fish chum, uh, basically chopped up fish parts that they would throw out into the water and these seabirds would just descend in mass uh, which was why the birds were coming around because they could hear the motor of the boat and they knew that when that boat was coming food was on the way well I had a great morning. I had a camera with me. Okay, my I had my uh, my Olympus, and I I was just snapping pictures. I took over a thousand pictures in the two hours that we were out there, and today I still treasure those pictures of albatrosses because I will never get to see them again. Okay, these are not things you see on the beach. You have to be out at the sea. But that's not the story I want to tell you. The story I want to tell you is when we were coming back into port. As we were coming back into the port, things got really tense because the fog was still there. And we were now moving towards the shore, not away. And those lookouts on either side of the boat and the, in the front, the pilot's eyes were glued on that depth finder. And as he approached shore, he was gingerly trying to find where the channel was. And he made several false starts at coming into shore and, and couldn't find it. He'd, 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 he'd just run into the cliff. And, and then he'd move move over a little direction this way, a little towards this way, and try again to find the channel, bringing him safely into port. And several times as we were going on, he's glued, his, his eyes are glued on that depth finder, and he's trying to find the channel, and all of a sudden one of the, one of the lookouts would shout, ROCKS! And immediately the engines would reverse and we would stop, okay? We just... Okay, <laughs> it was a tense time. Okay, now eventually he found the channel and eventually, obviously, we safely made it into port. But I'll never forget that experience of approaching port in a ship. I was reminded of that experience this week as I was preparing. I was reading the autobiography of Helen Keller and she used an experience similar to this as an illustration of her life. Let me just read how she put it. Have you ever been at sea in a dense fog when it seemed as if a tangible white darkness shut you in and the great ship, tense and anxious, groped her way toward the shore with plummet and sounding line and you waited with beating heart for something to happen. I was like that ship. If you don't know the story of Helen Keller, Helen Keller was, was a, a girl who was born in Alabama. Um, this was 1880 when she was born. Um, and for the first 19 months of her life, she was the star of the show. She was the first daughter in a second family. Her father's first wife had died. He had two sons, but they were older. Um, and he and his new wife, uh, Helen, was the first child in their family. And she was, she was the apple of daddy's eye, and mama was so proud of her. You know how it is with young children. And then at 19 months, she came down with an infection and she lost both her hearing and her sight. She was blind and she was deaf. And she rapidly lost all of the baby talk that she had acquired at 19 months. She, she would still sometimes make a sound that sounded like wah-wah when she was thirsty and wanted some water, but that was the only language, the only word 
that she retained. Now she developed a way of communicating with the family, but it was very concrete. Come, she would pull on you. That meant come. Go away, she would push you. If she wanted bread, she would pantomime slicing the bread and buttering it. If she wanted ice cream for supper, she would, she would pantomime operating the ice cream freezer. You young folks won't understand this, so Google it, okay? A hand-operated ice cream freezer, okay? She would pantomime that and, and pretend to be cold. But this kind of concrete communication was limited in what it could convey. And as the family tried to communicate with her, they, 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 they used the same literal signs, but they could only explain so much. And she began to become more and more frustrated. She couldn't communicate what she desired. And by the time she was seven, this started to translate into violent outbursts, not just temper tantrums. Um, when she was six or seven, she learned the secret of lock and key. And one day she locked her mommy in the pantry when nobody else was in the house. And then she sat outside on the floor with her back against the pantry door, feeling the vibrations of mommy pounding frantically on the door. Two and a half hours later, the family came home to find mommy still weakly pounding on the door. And then there was another episode where <laughs> where she was she she spilled tea on her apron and she spread it out in front of the fireplace to dry but she got frustrated because it was still wet and so she took the apron and threw it onto the flames to make it dry faster and of course a blaze flared up engulfed her her clothes caught on fire and it took quick action on the part of a servant in the household who, who ran in and heard her cry and ran in and saw her in flames and wrapped her up in a, in, a, in a carpet and rolled her around to smother the flames. Um, people who were deaf in those days were generally treated as if they were imbeciles, uneducatable, stupid, retarded. Yeah, all of those words. And people who were deaf and blind, even more so. So the extended family with these outbursts and these, she was a danger to herself and to others. And the, they started saying, you know, you need to put her away, put her into an institution. She's impossible. You can't take care of her. She's going to kill you or kill herself. Burn the house down. And her mother and father became desperate. Her mother had read a story um, in a book by Charles Dickens that talked about a doctor in Boston who had successfully taught a woman, a, a woman who was blind and deaf, how to communicate. But even when Charles Dickens wrote his book, that doctor had been long dead. And he said that nobody knew how he had taught what methods he used. Still, they started looking for answers and um, they heard about a doctor. They li the family lived in Alabama, but they were the who's who of Alabama. Had been for a long time. There were governors and generals in their, their ancestry and they heard about a doctor in Baltimore, an eye doctor, who, who was able to cure the incurable. And on a desperate whim, they took Helen to see the doctor. The doctor was compassionate, but he's, 
it was very clear there was nothing that he was going to be able to do to fix her eyes. However, he referred them to Alexander Graham Bell. We know him today as being famous for inventing the telephone. The telephone was not what he was famous for during his lifetime. What he was famous for was his investment in educating the deaf. And so the doc eye doctor referred him, referred the family to Alexander Graham Bell. And Alexander Graham Bell listened to their story and was very encouraging. She can be educated. She is not stupid. She is not dumb. She just needs the right teacher. He referred them to Boston to a school for the blind, which was where the woman that Charles Dickens had wrote about was a teacher. Maybe they could find an appropriate teacher who would be willing to move to rural Alabama, out in the Hicks, down south, to teach Helen. So they traveled to Boston. They had no teachers available, but they said they would look. And then they traveled back home to Alabama. Three months later, Anne Sullivan arrived and became Helen's teacher, companion for the rest of Anne's life, constantly with her. Now, when Anne arrived, she, she brought with her a doll, a china doll. She brought with her a china doll that had been the been um, bought by the students at the school for the blind as a gift to Helen, and the teacher, who was deaf and blind, had dressed the doll. This was a meaningful gift, but Helen had no idea because. Helen had no way of communicating. Anne took the doll and put it in, in Helen's arms, and Helen's, Helen got all excited and started playing with it and exploring it and feeling it and touching it. This was a new experience. This was exciting. This was interesting. And then Anne took her hand and started signing into her palm an alphabet spelling doll. Now, I don't know what the hand out, the, the finger alphabet was that she used, okay? I'm just making symbols. But Helen felt this going on in her hand and realized that it was intentional because it was happening repetitively. And she started trying to imitate what Anne was doing. And pretty soon she could make the same hand motions as Anne was making and she got all excited and she ran in to her mama and she 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 made the hand signs in her mama's hand to show her what she could do it was so exciting she had no idea she was spelling she had no idea these were words this was a new game hand puzzles and 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 over the course of the next month she learned like 50 different words 50 different hand puzzles she had no idea these were words. There was no connection with objects or anything. She just learned different patterns. But you know, after a month of playing this game and mastering 50 different hand puzzles, the game started wearing old. And then the teacher started doing incomprehensible stuff. Okay? And one day she put the china doll in her hand and she's in her arms and then she spelled doll and then she put a rag doll in her arms and spelled doll and then took the rag doll away and put the china doll in and it was just really frustrating because she wasn't letting Helen play with the dolls she was trying to communicate something she was doing something but Helen had no idea what she was doing and finally she got so frustrated that she took the china doll and she just threw it. 
and it shattered. And patiently swept up the pieces and then took Helen out for a walk to kind of distract, de refocus things. They went down to the pump house and at the pump house somebody was pumping water. They were drawing water for the kitchen. And Anne took Helen's hand and put it under the pump, letting the cool water run over her hand, and then into the other hand started spelling water. First slowly and then quickly. And I'm going to read how Helen described in her autobiography. If I can find my way back to it after the water, uh, the wind uh, blew, <coughs> blew my papers around. So, as the stream, cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still, my whole attention fixed upon the motions of her fingers, and suddenly I felt a misty consciousness as of something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew that W-A-T-E-R meant that wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. I left the well house eager to learn. One of the touchstones of a spiritual life, a meaningful life, as evidenced in the lives of the men and women in the Bible. Centers on language. Specifically, communication between God and man. God is not just our creator. God is not just compassionate. God communicates with us. That is a touchstone of spirituality in the lives of the men and women of the Bible. The human race was not thrown into this world deaf and blind, limited to deciphering life through trial and error, running into brick walls, bloodying our noses. Oh, believe me, we do that a lot. But that was not God's intention. There is a God, the God who designed us, who created the world, who cares about us and who communicates with us, guiding us and enlightening us. Now make no mistake, the people in the Bible struggled with this touchstone. You see, God was not predictable. Sometimes he talked, sometimes he didn't. Sometimes they really wanted him to communicate and all there was was silence. Some people sat at his feet eagerly listening. Other people heard his voice and ran screaming in terror or erupted into furious anger. Some people listened to what he had to say and some people would have nothing with it. But most people, most people simply treated it as unbelievable. That at the center of the worldview and the Bible, whether they believed it or not, whether they acted upon it or not, at the center of the spiritual life of the people in the Bible was this touchstone. God communicates. What we call the Bible is simply the result of that touchstone. It contains what they heard, what they understood, stories of how they responded, 
And for me, removing this touchstone from my spiritual life takes the heart out of it. It reduces me to having to find my way on my own to determine what is real, what is true, alone. The COVID pandemic has, has revealed the pitfalls of that course. You see, most of us ignore science for the majority of our lives. We don't understand how it works. We don't understand the language it uses. And so we do not trust its conclusions. We only trust what we can see and touch and experience for ourselves. But COVID has made visible how fragile that kind of a truth-finding is. We find ourselves, I mean, when COVID struck, many of us were already biased to disbelieve anything that scientific authorities said and to believe anyone who disagreed with them. And we find ourselves just like the people Helen Keller described in that boat. Tense and anxious, forced to move forward in our lives but afraid of the consequences of getting it wrong or angry at the people who are shouting warnings at us of danger that we have no way of knowing whether they're right or wrong because we're surrounded by fog. I find the same thing true in my quest for, my meaningful li for a meaningful life. For spiritual life. Many of us have neglected the Bible for years. We've neglected this touchstone. There are so many interpretations about the Bible that we don't trust anyone's interpretations, especially our own. Even Christians are more likely to choose their church based on how charismatic the pastor is or how exciting the worship service is than on how closely the church adheres to what the Bible says. But take a God who communicates out of the equation, and when life gets difficult, we find ourselves in that ship at sea, surrounded by fog, tense and anxious, moving towards shore, fearful of disaster. Friends, I encourage you to pick up the touchstone. If you're a Christian, start reading your Bibles. Start studying your Bibles. It's not you who have to interpret the Bible. God is trying to communicate with you today. And for my friends who I have been terming spiritual but not religious, I just want you to ask yourself, what would it be like if there was somebody bigger than you trying to communicate with you. Would you listen? Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.